Thank you. Any burning questions? Yeah. How do I guess I'm in the state playing this direction? 
That's okay, because we're going to figure out something. Yeah. Yeah. Say hi. Hi. Thank you. Go see the governor. I mean, everybody. This way, and then I can. Ha I'll have this available so that because I know out of the people I was able to email with, there were a, quite a few that couldn't come in person, and um, some that wanted to know if they could watch it later. If it so. Yeah. This will be a good as soon as I figure out what I'm doing. Yeah, if I give you my email, would you be able to send like maybe that pie graph yeah. over my way? That'd be very helpful. Yeah.
Oh, you help me. Yeah. Because if I don't do this one just right, it will never just hold it while I set this down. It just stayed where I was. First time doing my live stream, so forgive me for feeling like that's awkward and I'm talking to an empty room. It's totally not the case. Um, my name is Sean O'Leary with the Center on Budget and Policy, and I'm here today to talk about our report we just put out on uh, the higher education budget in the state and how years of cuts have really had a major impact. It has made things pretty rough. Um, before we can talk about higher ed, about the budget as a whole a little bit. Um, this is just a, a, a breakdown of the state's base budget. Um, higher education makes up a little less than 9% of the entire state budget. Interesting about this particular chart, and it kind of shows you why when the state is making budget cuts, when the legislators feel they need to cut the budget, higher education is one of the areas they look to first. Um, about two-thirds of our budget is statutorily or constitutionally protected. With public education, there is a, a formula that the state Supreme Court has set up that says how much money the state can or can meet, has to spend on higher on K through 12 education. Um, if the state were to try to keep that part of the budget, they could end up in court and the school officials could sue them. Um, the other big chunk of the budget is uh, Medicaid, the HHR Medicaid program. That is sort of statutorily protected, meaning that the state can't just go in and cut Medicaid. They change the law, either uh, change eligibility, change provider payments, change some of the rates. So, plus, the fact is that on uh, any cut from Medicaid, uh, the state is matched three to three to one by the federal government. So, if you cut a dollar out of Medicaid, you're actually losing three dollars of federal funding in the state. Because Medicaid would have a big impact on rural hospitals and really health care uh, throughout the state. So when you take those two big chunks out, some of the other chunks out, you can sort of see that, that higher education is one of the, uh, the 
big parts of the budget left that the, the, that's easiest to cut that the legislature can just go in and, and take a chunk out of without without too much effort and that, that sort of explains why it's under life so often. Um, so why have we been cutting the budget so much recently in higher education? Well we've had recently we've had a growing budget gaps each and every year uh, starting around 2014. Um, it wasn't too bad. Last year we had a $558 million budget gap that we had to close. This year we're looking at a just a million dollar budget gap. And of a state budget that's you know around four and a half billion dollars, that's pretty significant. So we've really had some some budget difficulties these past few years. So to get into the question of why we've had budget difficulties, um, we've had a revenue problem. We've basically gone 10 years without having any revenue growth in the state. Um, if you adjust for inflation, we collected $570 million fewer in 2017 than we did back in 2008. So the cost of health care goes up, the cost of salaries go up, all, the, all, these, all, all these costs on the state basis go up each year, but the revenue that's coming in is not growing to, to match those costs, which is how we end up with these budget gaps. So to answer the question, growing, there's pretty much uh, three main reasons that we like to be uh, we can see. The first one I don't have a slide for, but it's basically the economy is not doing great. We never really recovered from the Great Depression, Great Recession. Uh, we, we had a little bit of a bounce back, but we still have fewer jobs today than we did nearly 10 years ago. It means less revenue, less sales tax revenue, less income tax revenue. Not a really healthy economy. We're just sort of struggling along trying to, to make do. And that has an impact on the budget. Um, the other reasons that I do have slides for are tax cuts. Uh, we've enacted a series of major tax cuts in 2007, and that's taken a big chunk of our revenue. Grocery tax, about 160 million. We, we did a couple of business tax cuts, million dollars in tax cuts, uh, some personal income tax cuts. Uh, and these have added up to you know it's over 425 million dollars in 2015. So that number is actually probably grown since then. That's, that's the reason. Um, and the third reason has to do with severance tax. <clears throat> severance taxes are our tax on coal and natural gas. And what we've seen in the past few years is even though we are producing a ton of natural gas, the price of natural gas has fallen dramatically. So while we're producing more gas, we're actually getting less revenue. 2014-2016, our severance tax revenue declined by $242 million. Some of that was just the decline of coal that everyone's really familiar with, but a big chunk of that was the fact that the price of natural gas uh, was uh, by more than half, right? and that really took a big bite of the revenue. So that that gold bar, you can see the severance tax revenue for natural gas shrinking, even though we produced a lot more natural gas. So those are the, the three the three main reasons we've had uh, revenue problems. Uh, bad economy, tax cuts, seven cents. You, you combine all those factors and you can see that we really are, are at an all-time low when it comes to the state investing in itself. Our, our tax revenue as a share of the economy has, has declined dramatically over the past 10 years. Um, historically, we've averaged about 6.8% of tax revenue as a share of the economy, so for every economic activity in the state, the, 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 the state will collect about $6.80 worth of tax revenue. Now we're down below uh, 6%. And the, the difference between where we're at now and what our historical average is, is that about $628 million. So our tax revenues have maintained the growth of the economy to $28 million of uh, additional revenue. So, uh, you know, not enough revenue, uh, revenue shrinking as a share of the economy, tax cuts taking their toll, severance tax causing problems. Taking uh, 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 an axe to the budget. Uh, basically, across the board, every agency has been cut since 2012. Um, the DHHR and Medicaid, which has grown over that time. Um, and as you can see, one of the biggest areas that have taken a hit has been higher education for the, for the reasons we talked about. So now we'll actually get to the actual the impact of the higher ed cuts. Um, so higher education funding has sharply declined since 2008. So if you would just for inflation, our uh, state support for higher education has gone down about $131 million. We spent, just for inflation, about $588 million on higher education 
all of our other community colleges, all that great stuff. Um, in 2007, to appropriate $456 million. That's a significant uh, uh, higher education. And, and just you know, zeroing in on WVU, since that's where we're at today, their state funding since 2013, so not even that long ago, has been cut 15% from about $134 million to about $113 million. Now, these cuts have not come without consequences. They, they have um, they've had an impact on, on our institutions. And the biggest impact that you can see has been on tuition. We've had uh, tuition double at every public four year college in Western Two. So, this chart, um, if you can see it, I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, uh, shows 2002 for each college in the state. If it had only grown just for inflation, so if tuition had gone up just at the rate of inflation in the state, or the yeah, be. And then there in the gold bar is the actual tuition in 2016. So we'll go ahead and look again at West Virginia University. Uh, in 2002, tuition was about $3,200. $3,200, and it just plotted with two, uh, inflation for the next uh, 14 years to get to 2016. Tuition would have been. $4,300. So an increase, but not a, a huge increase. That's a, a little bit of an increase every year. Instead, uh, tuition is just under $8,000. So, so more than double, almost more than double the rate of inflation, let alone the, the actual tuition increase. But that's not that's not characteristic only of WVU. That, that's been the case at colleges big and small throughout the state. Marshall's seen similar increases. Bluefield State, Glenville State, Tech. All the state, and the, and the same. You could have a, a similar chart for a community technical college. Just they too have seen uh, led to tuition hikes. Now, these tuition hikes have have uh, made college more affordable, and they've had um, an impact on, on, on families and, and students and, and health as we as we try to apply a, a more prosperous growth. Um, but one of the more interesting things is that. The, the way that this has happened is that as the state reduces its support and tuition increases, the colleges themselves are leaning more heavily on the students to, to fund their, their operations. So this is a chart, and again, I don't know how well you're able to see, but the, the solid blue line per student. So for, for every dollar the state spends on higher education per student at these institutions. So historically, it's been around $6,000 a little bit lower, but it's gone down over the past five, six, seven years to you know, under $5,000, so $5,000 loss. Um, that gold line is the net tuition per student, how much students are paying in tuition, financial assistance, and all those things. And as you can see, those two lines are, are almost inverted. As, as, as uh, state support goes down, tuition goes up. But the really interesting line of this chart that I thought was fascinating was the, the, the dotted blue line with the, the gold little. Um, um, that is the share of university operating expenses borne by the students. So how much of the college's operating expenses, how much of those costs that the, the, the university has are the students themselves paying for the tuition prices? So way back when, in the early 2000s, it was around 42-43%. It's near 60%. So students now are responsible for well over half of the cost of the university um, because the state itself uh, the state government has, has really sure to push on the students um so like i said tuition increases are making colleges affordable tuition is increasing faster than inflation it's increasing faster than wages it's increasing faster than incomes it's increasing faster than just about any medical cost Tuition is outpacing all of them. So this chart shows um, what the average tuition is as a share of the median household income. So sort of how much effort will the typical family in West Virginia have to to muster children to college? So again, it's still around under 10%. So if you wanted to send your kid to college and, and, and you wanted to you know, pay the tuition yourselves as a family, it will take about 10% of your income. Fast forward to uh, 2015, which was the most recent year we had data for, 16.1%. So a big difference between how much effort your family would have to spend to, to send you to college in 2000, you know, 
2000s versus how much you have to spend today. So when college becomes more unaffordable for families, um, and, and you can't cover those tuition costs yourself, people turn to financial aid. Uh, the same same things happen with financial aid. Um, it's losing its value faster than tuition is growing. So this, this is for federal coverage. There's about 30,000 uh, students in Washington colleges who, who uh, use a, a federal uh, Pell Grant to, to pay for the tuition. Um, and this is the share of your average tuition in West Virginia covered by the average federal Pell Grant. So just a typical student getting a Pell Grant um, paying the typical cost of tuition in West Virginia. Yeah, back in the early 2000s, if you got a Pell Grant, you qualified for a Pell Grant, could receive one, it would cover about 80% of your tuition. So you only have to make up, you know, a, um, a few hundred dollars. Um, that's gone down sharply. It bounced back up a little bit. You can see in the chart with some stimulus function. But once these budget cuts started happening in 2014, 2015, the hike started to happen, the Pell Grant has really lost its value. It bounced down to just over half. So from 80% of your tuition will be covered by a federal Pell Grant to just, uh, just over 54%. Uh, that really, uh, those low income students who are, who are counting on Pell Grants to, to college, it's, it's, it's not covering nearly as much as the states have as it used to. The same is true for the state's uh, financial aid. Um, the financial aid programs that the state has. We the, the HEAPS program, and they all are covering less tuition than they did in the past. The tuition is growing faster than all of these programs. The program only covers about 15%, where it used to cover about 32% of your tuition. Promise scholarships lost about a third of its value, where it used to cover all of your tuition, now only covers about 67%. Um, same story with the higher education grant program. It used to cover about 68%, now it covers about 33%. <coughs> More harder for families to afford. It's becoming harder to find financial aid to cover your tuition costs. So, what happens to students then? They turn to student loans. So, as tuition has gone up, so has student loan debt. The average Western college student loan debt has increased since 2005, uh, about $16,000 per student loan. Uh, about $27,000. That's significant. When you graduate and you're making those loan payments, that's you're not making on a house, that's payment you're not making on a car, it's not payment, it's payment you're not spending on the local economy, helping the economy grow. Um, these are payments that are should have been, should have been elsewhere, but instead, that. Um, and when you're a state like West Virginia and, and you're struggling, you can also put paying jobs. You see the situation that West Virginia is in, where we have the second highest rate of student loan default. Um, more of our students are defaulting on their loans than almost every other state because our debt load is growing so quickly and, and, and the economy is not going so great for students to graduate. Um, good news is, there is no good news. Um, there are further higher education cuts on the horizon. Uh, this was Governor Justice's budget plan. And his budget plan for, for closing this year's budget gap is to, to raise $352 million of new tax revenue, which really upset some people. And everyone thought that was a, a lot of, of tax increases for one year. Even with that, those tax increases, I was wrong, there were still cuts to higher education. There's still going to be a $6 million cut to the OBU, and there's still going to be a $2.8 million cut to, to, to Marshall. So there was still Budget cuts even with significant new revenues. The legislature put together a budget framework where they weren't going to have so many tax cuts, but they were going to also uh, cut higher education, even though um, some of their things were moving stuff around. They still were foreseeing a $15 million cut to higher education on top of Governor Conley's proposed cuts. This plan is probably. Um, might not happen because some of the revenue measures that they expected to be part of the package have failed in the House. So the uh, uh, beer tax and the, uh, I don't know, I can't recall right now. But those two, um, was that what was the other one? Yeah, I can't remember. 
Good times. It's the only one I care about. Good times. It was the only one that they got really into. Yeah, it's a good times. Yeah. And they were all in the same sentence. Anyway, fair. So, whatever revenue they don't raise, the film industry, they did away with the film industry tax factor. Yes. Now they did. So, that's less revenue coming into the budget, so they're going to need a need for more budget costs, and those budget costs will make it go to the higher end. Some other frameworks we're talking about, like $50 million in, um, that would nearly equal the, the past six, seven years of cuts, so that would be a big, a tough pill to swallow. Um, Governor Justice had an alternative budget where he lined out where the cuts would come from if there were no revenues raised, and that involved basically just shutting down all the small uh, colleges in the state, closing all the uh, community technical colleges as well, and additionally, partial WVU's funding by 50%. So, not, not a pretty picture. Um, is that what the people of West Virginia want? It turns out no. Um, if you, if you, we did a little survey uh, of what people thought about the budget and what their priorities were. And thinking, you know, we asked them, proud of the budget, would you be willing to pay more of your kind of taxes to uh, to pay for those priorities? And 70% of them said, yeah, I raise my name for the things I care about. And it turns out higher education is one of those things they care about. So this was uh, like a question, you know, do you oppose these budget items? Do you oppose increasing tuition? 83% said yes. Do you oppose, oppose cutting community colleges? 80% said yes. Do you oppose cutting four-year colleges? 70% said yes. Um, do you oppose eliminating the promise commission? 71% said yes. So not only are people willing to raise their own taxes to pay for things they care about, higher education is one of the things they really, really care about. Um, that's good news. If we can translate that news to the legislature, plenty of revenue options that, that the legislature has in front of them to, to pay for that. Uh, all these, but there's ways to raise revenue in a progressive way that doesn't burden the working, working families and low and moderate income families. And, and we can talk about those at some other live stream event if we want to. Um, search on, on West Virginia and why it's poor and what we can do about it. and, and Lack of education in its workforce is one of the chief reasons why West Virginia struggles, why we struggle economically, why we uh, can't seem to attract businesses, why our incomes are always so low, and, and there's several reasons why, but that lack of education it is certainly one of them. And to, to put West Virginia on a path forward to, to grow and prosper, making higher education affordable it is certainly one of those policies that has been shown to work in other places and has shown the fill a need that West Virginia has. Um, that's why we have put together the Protect West Virginia campaign, a coalition of citizens and organizations that are willing to, to work at the legislature to say, this is something we care about, this is something that West Virginia needs, um, we shouldn't be cutting, we should be investing, and we need to connect those values, state, higher education, K-12 education infrastructure to make sure we connect those values to the state budget so the state budget reflects those values. Um, if you have any more questions or about Protect West Virginia, you know, check it out, protectwb.org, right? Or uh, call up Tara Martinez, the lovely lady over there that's not on camera, but she's here. Um, and she will give you all the information you want to have. March 31st, we are having a Protect West Virginia Lobby Day at the Capitol. We're going to go there and we are going to bring our pitchforks and we're going to make sure that all $131 million that they've taken from higher education is put back in and tuition is... <laughs> we're going to change the state's future on that day. But no, no, we can't do it alone. We can't do it by ourselves. We need people like you out there on the, the wild frontier of the internet who are listening right now. To, uh, to contact your legislators and, and, and let them know that you care about higher education, you want to see it protected, you want to see funding put back, costs brought back down, and you want the state to grow. This is one way to do it. So thank you for watching, thank you for listening. You're not here, so I can't take questions, so sorry about that. <laughs>